Carrie, welcome to the Health Path podcast. It's really good to finally connect. Thank you, Alex. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Yeah, well, I was just saying off air, I think it was probably only two or three months ago that I stumbled across your Instagram account. And I can only imagine that someone sort of shared one of your posts and that kind of draw me in. And I feel like you're probably the person that I've stalked the most on Instagram. <laughs> 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 um, because I said again off air that you have a great ability to explain what can be incredibly complex science and for a lot of us brand new science things that we've never even heard of never even sort of comprehended so I just want to kind of say that off the back I guess that you know you do an amazing job at breaking this down into actionable and understandable content Thank you. And my goal is to make this accessible, uh, accessible to people because I think this information is really important, but it's new to almost everyone. And so in order to get people to recognize how important it is, we have to make sure they understand it, right? Right, absolutely. So before we dive into some of this stuff, do you want to just do a, a kind of a bit of a background into who you are, what you do and how you got into this? Yeah, sure. So, you know, my name is Carrie Bennett and I, uh, I've always been interested in health and fitness, you know, from being a high school athlete to a college athlete. And then, uh, when I graduated from college, I had the option to do a couple of different things. You know, I studied science in undergrad and there was med school and there was PhD programs waiting. And I had this complete mental breakdown and told my parents, I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to become a massage therapist. And they were like, okay, you know, that's like a, a bit of a 180 from where you were going. And something back then just told me, I said that I had, I had a conversation with, you know, one of my mentors back then. And I said, you know, I just don't feel like medicine is the way that I want to reach people these days. And I, in undergrad, I studied microbiology and I was in a microbiology lab all the time. And I said to my mentor, I said, and I don't want to be stuck in lighting like that all day, you know, like with the fluorescent light, I just knew without really knowing what I know now, I knew deep down that those environments just didn't seem like healthy for me and didn't seem like ways that I could really impact people. And for whatever reason, I made a 180. I went to massage therapy school. My parents were like, okay, you know, put yourself through massage therapy school. So, so I, I did what I knew. I, I was an athlete. I knew how to work out. So I became a personal trainer. I, you know, had a little personal training studio, a massage therapy studio. And then, you know, as we go, it's like, we pick up, we pick up little things it's like, yeah, that's important, but it's not the end all be all. So exercise, yes, massage was a different level. Then, uh, you know, I had my first child and my digestion just went wrong. Like it went off the charts, horrible. Um, I got extreme fatigue, insomnia, and all of those things made me realize like, okay, I wasn't getting the answers that I wanted from going to traditional medical doctors. And so I went back to grad or to school and I got my graduate degree in uh, applied clinical nutrition. So, you know, then I started working with people on nutrition and it was, again, it was another piece of the puzzle. And then about five years ago, I was introduced to the work of Jack Cruz, Dr. Cruz, and he focuses a lot on what I didn't understand at the time at all, but quantum biology and circadian rhythm and this idea of uh, treating our body and helping it heal and thrive at that quantum level. And so for five years, I did a deep dive and have been now, I, that's what I teach. I work, that's, the, that's my go-to with my clients, new clients, my clients that I've had for 10 years. It's like, we talk about quantum biology, circadian rhythm, and all the ways we can use the strategies that I've uncovered, you know, through the help of other researchers like Dr. Cruz and Mei Wan Ho and these wonderful people who have just put this great work out uh, and how to really take their work and how to apply it to people so that they can feel awesome. Amazing. I love that journey. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so there are two terms that might be worth kind of just defining or breaking down in regards to quantum biology and circadian rhythm. So what would be like a simple way of thinking about these? Quantum biology is the idea that we have to understand our body on a slightly smaller scale than I think what we typically think of. So, you know, I tell people that our body is made up of a bunch of organs and each organ is made up of a bunch of cells and each cell, you know, organizes a bunch of proteins and each protein is made up of a bunch of molecules, you know, and each molecule is made up of a bunch of atoms. And then these atoms are actually made up of basically what we thought of maybe in, it's somewhere in grade school, right? We, we learned electron, proton, and neutron. And maybe that's 
all we did. We learned it at some point back in the day in our schooling and we forgot about it. But we have to recognize that we're made up of those little tiny particles and they're called subatomic particles. And that's the quantum level of talking about how to in influence those particles so that they make better molecules and better proteins and cells and tissues and organs and ultimately a better, a better body. So that's the quantum biology. <laughs> Brilliant. And it kind of, you know, I think it's intuitive because a lot of practitioners who aren't aware of quantum biology are saying the same thing, but they're just starting higher up the ladder. Um, they're exactly. talking about, let's say, cellular health impacting organ health, impacting system health, impacting organism health. So it's just a natural evolution in some ways into kind of that next layer. Um, and then before I forget, sort of circadian biology, just in case we don't have anyone or if, if we do have people that don't yet understand that term, what are we kind of referring to here? That's this idea that um, our body does things in a typical repeatable fashion within a 24 hour day. And so it, we, if we think about the complexity of our bodies, every single cell has 100,000 tasks. It has to organize every single second which is um, astronomical to think of. And so there has to be some governing signal that helps to tell which cells what to do when. And if there wasn't, that, that's, that would be chaos, right? And chaos at that cellular level, that's synonymous with inflammation. It's synonymous with a dysfunctional cell, a cell that's not operating at its best. And so every living creature has had really one main thing that they've been able to kind of tune their day to, and that's the length of daylight and a length, a period of darkness. And so that's that's what the circadian rhythm really is. It's we've optimized certain functions to happen throughout the 24 hour clock during the day and then also at night. And that way we prioritize things that we, that you know we could accomplish during the day. Like for example, it would make the most sense for my digestion to be awake and alert and active during the day as opposed to in the middle of the night when my body needs to repair itself and you know encode my memories from short-term storage to long-term recall. So the body has de decided what needs to be done within a, a 24 hour clock and that's my circadian rhythm. Perfect. And yeah, I guess the research coming out around that is just exploding really. I was um I was delivering a webinar on GERD or reflux um, yesterday and kind of looking at some of the research around circadian biology, melatonin, and the roles that they play within this. You kind of, you quickly appreciate just how important it is, even to conditions that you might not uh, initially think would have any sort of connection to it. So the fact that you mentioned the gut as an example there is, uh, is interesting straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, that, that we think about digestion of food, that's like one of the most energy draining tasks. We don't think, realize it, but to, to digest, not only to acquire it, like acquiring it's easy these days. Back in the day, it was probably a little harder. Um, but in order to acquire food and then digest it and extract all the nutrients, that takes so much time and energy. And so we want to then be able to do that in conjunction with when our digestive juices are at their strongest. And we're actually able to move the food through the gut in, a, in an appropriate timeline so that we can extract those nutrients. And so all of that just ties into what's happening with our light environment outside and then with the darkness at night. Mm, okay. Um, and these are kind of called, um, if I pronounce it correctly, zygites in the research, right? Zeitgeibers, yeah. Zeitgeibers. And then mm -hmm. we have kind of nutrition and I think movement to kind of almost secondary level um, stimuli for this kind of circadian rhythm. Yeah, absolutely. So the number one signal is the light that we put into our eyes. Um, there's a direct connection. So that's the primary zeitgeber. It's, there's a direct connection between the eye and the brain. There's literally a little pathway, a little road that connects them. And so any light that enters our eyes, automatically that gets communicated a certain message to the middle of my brain. And in the middle of my brain, there's this master clock that, that keeps track of everything called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And it like vibrates and it, it literally oscillates and vibrates a certain message that then moves through my body via my water, the water in my body that then communicates what time of day it is to every single cell. We can enhance that zeitgeber signaling with when we eat and when we move, or we can actually create like a, uh, some disharmony. So for example, I have the zeitgeber that it's first thing in the morning and you know, my body wants to do X, Y, and Z. 
And I, and then instead I'm going to turn the temperature way down cold and try to go to bed. It's a very disjointed thing with my body. Instead, my body would expect a colder temperature at night as the day is ending. So temperature is a zeitgeber. And then I would get into sleep. Food would be the same thing. If I, if I think if I wake up at midnight, when my eyes perceive darkness, and then all of a sudden I decide to eat a, a large meal, that would be creating disharmony with my, with my circadian rhythm based on the timing of when I do certain things. Perfect. Okay. So coming back to the kind of quantum biology, am I right in saying that um, when we're on this topic, there is this kind of analogy of the three-legged stool, or I heard Dr. Cruz talk about the four-legged stool, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't do Bitcoin. I don't, I don't talk about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess unless you feel there's something that is worth mentioning first, should we kind of dive into these kind of three components? Sure. So the three components are light, water, and magnetism. And I do think light is the most important one to start off with because it's the most it's the easiest one to recognize uh, in our daily lives, you know, and, and how it influences us at that quantum level. Okay. So you've mentioned obviously um, natural light being the primary way that we can regulate the circadian rhythm. Um, how can we move that conversation forward, I guess? Like, where do you want to go first to help people understand the role of light in human health? I think it's important to recognize that not all light is created equal and that light from the sun, it contains a lot of information for that clock in our brain and for other parts of our body as well. And so when we are in natural light and when we actually allow it into our eyes, you know, cause sunglasses, right. That's the whole thing. Sunglasses are like putting a garbage bag over a plant and expecting that plant to get all, all that it needs. We know plants need light to thrive. We do too. So, so if we can be outside in the natural sunlight, sunlight is really amazing because it, it contains a blend of different colors that I, I liken to nutrients. Like, you know, it's, it's got a blend of nutrients, like a, a, a whole food as opposed to a processed food. And so if we were to shine just regular old sunlight through a, a prism, everyone would recognize the colors of the rainbow. And then outside of the colors of the rainbow, we also have a portion of sunlight called infrared. It's closer to the red, but it's a little outside the red. That's what we kind of are synonymous with heat. And then ultraviolet, which we hear a lot about with. So we hear like the damaging ultraviolet light. And that's what the sun gives us. But the sun doesn't just shoot all those rays at us first thing in the morning. The sun kind of layers on the colors of the rainbow at us all day long. And then after the sun reaches its high point in the sky, it takes those colors away in a very systematic way. And each of those colors actually kind of does something biologically for our bodies. And if it's not us, it's another creature on this planet that, you know, utilizes a certain color of the light. Um, and so we, we get the colors in a certain way. They go away in a certain predictable way, day in and day out. And we can then sync up based on what goes into our eyes, different processes in the body. And it's especially those morning hours that are really key, it appears, for my circadian rhythm and for just optimizing my human function for the day uh, to get those morning frequencies into my eyes because they do so much. So that's, that's natural light, right? That's sunlight. We compare that to a light bulb or to a screen these are so foreign because they oftentimes don't contain every color of the rainbow. They definitely never contain ultraviolet or infrared. Those are missing and they never change. So this screen is giving my eyes the same color message all day long. Uh, same with the light bulb, same with my phone screen. And that's a confusing thing to my brain because my clock in my brain wants the variation and it's not getting it. Perfect. And I think even down to, as you sort of talk about their human function and the fact that the early um, hours of that sunlight is sort of priming us. And that comes down to also how our skin is responding to that light, right? A hundred percent. So yes, the skin can act like a secondary eye almost. So the same light receptors we have in our eyes, we have on our skin. We also have them on the surfaces of our gut and lung because in utero, those uh, tissues used to all be the same tissue before they kind of diversified their function. Mm -hmm. So it's fascinating to think that we've got light receptors in our gut and our lung tissue, but we do. Um, and so, yeah, so the skin can matter too. And so like if for those aren't, or who aren't familiar with this term receptor, 
in the backs of our eyes, I liken it now this, so I'm, I'm American, right? And so I use a baseball analogy, but I think, I think we can all picture, right? You know, like these little catcher's mitts, right? So like these little catcher's mitts waiting in the backs of the eyes and literally light acts like a, a, a baseball or a ball. And, and it gets kind of shot into our eyes, if you will, in a way that we don't feel, but it gets shot into our eyes and it interacts with these mitts in the back of our eyes. And whatever, depending on the color, of, of light, the color of a little baseball that gets shot out of the sun and caught by these mitts, that communicates a message to my brain. And the main one that my brain tunes into is the color blue. And so that's cool because there's no blue before sunrise. And then as the sun rises, the amount of blue light that the sun shoots at us gets higher and higher and more and more until the sun's at its high point. And then it goes away until after sunset, there's no blue either. So I literally have these little catcher's mitts waiting to catch those blue photons to tell my brain what time of day it is based on the amount of uh, photons they catch. Amazing. Okay, so with all of that in mind, we are saying that light is the primary regulator of circadian rhythm. Um, but there's, with my limited understanding here, there's also, and going back to our sort of tripod chair, there's a nice intimate connection between light and water, for example. Um, so do you want to kind of just touch on some of that as well? Yeah, I do. And I could spend all day. This is my favorite, favorite thing that I've learned in quantum biology. And it just, this is where the light bulb went off for me. It was like, wow, this is powerful stuff. So, you know, Alex, we hear, right? Like the human body is 70% water, right? We, we hear that all the time. That's not something that's going to confuse everyone. Yes. We, we were made of water. We, if we're dehydrated, it impacts our cells. So we know that we are made of water and we need water. But what I don't think is really well appreciated, and it's just starting to become more and more accepted, although it's still, you know, there's still some people who think that this is fringe, even though it's the, the research has been around for 30 years, but the water inside of us is different. It's not like water in a glass, you know, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't swirl around. It organizes itself inside of the cell and outside of the cell into like a gel consistency. So picture like a jello, right? It's so it's not a true liquid. And what they've found is that this water actually um, it's 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 very ordered. If you were to look at the patterning of how the water interacts with itself, like each other under a microscope, if you were to be able to look at the, the molecular level, it's very much structured like ice and ice is a very, very ordered version of water. Uh, liquid water is not liquid water is kind of the, the hydrogens and oxygens kind of slosh around back and forth. And that, so this is cool because the water inside of us is now considered like liquid crystal. So it's ordered like the ice in this very structured way, but it can still have some movement and some wiggling. It's still more of a liquid. And so it actually, we now know because it takes on that special character of a characteristic of a liquid crystal, it has so many cool properties that it uses to give our body health. So one of my prime examples, and this water is called easy water, exclusion zone water. If anyone goes onto my page, they know I'm all gung-ho about easy water. But what we know about this water is that it actually, it creates, uh, it, it, as it forms, it forms naturally everywhere there's a biological surface. So picture a cell with a membrane, let's go super basic. So the outside of the cell, let's picture the inside of the cell right next to that membrane, this really ordered gel water forms all the way around. And unlike water in a glass, which is, which is called neutral, it has no charge. This water has a negative charge. And immediately next to that ordered water is a line of positive charge. And so what you have here now, anytime there's a negative next to a positive, that's a battery. Take out, take a look at any battery in any device you have, you'll always see a positive end and a negative end because you need those two separate charges for electrons and electricity to be able to flow. And so the coolest research that I, that I have stumbled across, you know, five years ago was from Gerald Pollack's lab, who really is the, the, the prominent researcher when it comes to this type of water. And what he found was that if we take these tiny, tiny micro electrodes and we put one tiny little basically a wire into the negative part and a little tiny wire into the positive part it lit a light bulb so that means inside of us we've been taught that there we you know atp is our only form 
of of energy and we need to we only make that from food and we uh, we we have to eat to make energy and what i'm telling people is that we also have a secondary and actually i think this might be the primary mechanism and and the food atp is the secondary mechanism we actually when we get sunlight on, into our skin or onto our skin and into our bodies we make a bigger battery that water actually the negative part actually grows bigger the positive part grows bigger so basically we recharge this water battery inside of our bodies from infrared sunlight and infrared happens to be a frequency that's there from sunrise all the way until sunset so we got we've been given this beautiful opportunity to go outside and get this infrared light into our bodies to actually give us free energy amazing pretty wild <laughs> that is wild and again it's like I'm just thinking of all the different people that would benefit from understanding that you know the obvious ones of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia but what you mentioned earlier as well these light receptors in the guts from like an embryology sort of perspective it it's kind of it's just mind-blowing ultimately uh. It, 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 it's super mind blowing to recognize that we, we really run on electricity, you know, and we've been taught the chemical paradigm, which is, you know, which is where pharmaceuticals treat and supplements treat. And I'm not saying there's not a place for those things. I'm just saying we have to start recognizing that we're full of electricity and that's what the quantum world really deals with. It's like the flow of electricity and the ability to manipulate the electrical component of our bodies. And when you recognize it could be as simple as getting infrared sunlight on my body and, and that wavelength actually penetrates 30 centimeters so it can go into my body too that's beautiful for people who are suffering from digestive issues who only have a limited amount of food they feel like they could eat and they think they need to you know only get their energy that way and they they you know they they're, they they don't realize that yes you do extract nutrients from food, but while you're healing your gut and while you're maybe feeling like you're on this really restricted nutrition plan, you have a secondary energy source that you need to maximize. And that's called getting out, getting your skin into the sun and really charging up that water battery. Yeah. And some of the research on sort of certainly using sort of infrared light devices, mm -hmm. um, both animal and human studies showing like how microbiome diversity improves keystone species improve in quantity it's uh it's we've got the evidence there as well that this isn't as you say fringe or quackery or anything like this yeah this is i think so photobiomodulation this red light red light therapy has been studied again 30 years plus and we're seeing more and more benefits to it and i really think though the overarching theme is that these panels contain infrared to usually typically two wavelengths of infrared light that coincide with you know being able to soak them into our bodies and create that water network that structured water network at a bigger rate so that water battery charge is huge huge because that charge that battery energy can get donated to any process so if we have some dysfunction in this part of our body dysfunctional cells are actually they lack charge it, it, every cell again not controversial ask anyone who's ever studied you know human physiology every cell needs more electrons than protons they need a net negative charge and as that charge drains is when a cell starts to say oh i've got to start shutting down certain operations just like a cell phone you know you get your battery gets to four percent and the screen dims and you can't you know you can't download a video anymore and you can't you know make you know a long just like a call or whatever it might be like it, lots of functions start to shut down to preserve the cell phone usage a cell, a cell, you know, and besides not a mobile phone, but an actual cell does the same thing. It says, okay, what are Carrie's top priorities? Because we don't have enough energy to do everything she needs. So we're going to just do these few things, but we can only survive like that for so long before there's a dysfunction that starts to happen. And so what that cell is lacking is it's lacking energy and it's lacking electrons. And what we can do then is use the sunlight to just recharge those electrons so that that cell can now heal. And that cell can thrive and do all the tasks that it needs to do. Perfect. Okay. So if we were to summarize where we're at, we're, gonna... <laughs> <laughs> we're saying that light is the master regulator of our 24 hour clock. Uh, it's the main stimuli. It comes in through primarily the eyes, but as you mentioned, the skin as well, mm -hmm. it influences the SCN in the center of the brain. And that's sort of distributing messages to all our cells about what time of day it is and therefore what they should be doing kind of physiologically speaking. 
Um, we have mentioned sort of the spectrum of light and the rainbow, for example, which I love the idea of how it, it kind of mirrors kind of the dietary side of things. I love mm -hmm. that kind of idea. Um, and then we've spoken about how light is very much important as a way to charge the battery, which is where the water and the EZ water come into this piece as well. Correct. So that's sort of the light at the most simplistic level, obviously, kind of covered, I imagine. Um, where does the, unless there's something else you want to go into first, Carrie, so please do say, where's the kind of the magnetism that come into this? The, mag the magnetism is an interesting one. And uh, we at some point, I do want to talk light at night, right? I know you, I think that's an important one be to, to address for people. And it's an easy one for people to maybe, maybe manipulate in their lives to see an improvement in things like sleep, restorative sleep and stuff like that. But, um, but magnetism, again, if you were to pull, look up, you know, magnetic, uh, Earth's magnetic field, right? Do a quick search online for Earth's magnetic field. You would see that we've got a magnetic pole at the North Pole and the South Pole. And that we actually have like a magnetic field around the Earth um, that, that is formed because of how the lava flows like 20 miles down, like really deep down. Uh, we got these flows of lava that are just full of uh, charged metals and things like nickel and iron. And uh, anything that moves with a charge, this is physics. So you'll just have to, you'll just have to trust me on this one if you want to, but actually never trust anyone on anything. Look it up yourself. Um, would be to you, uh, the, the flowing charge creates its own magnetic field. So that anything that, that has a charge and flows creates its own magnetic field. And we just happen to have a lot of lava down there that's flowing. And so we get this big magnetic field. And um, that magnetic field also works with the water in our body because when our water is, uh, when, when the water in our body is in a magnetic field, it orients itself a certain way. And so not only do we have this battery that is formed from the sunlight, but the magnetic field kind of helps direct it a little bit more. It like, it's like almost as if I were to put, I have a battery and it's not quite connected exactly how I want it inside of something. And then all of a sudden it just kind of snaps in place and now it can do its job. It's the same thing. The water set, the water reacts to the magnetic field, which is stronger at night than it is during the day. And so it kind of orients itself at night a certain way to allow for healing. It really helps to orient the water molecules because at night when we sleep, we're supposed to be in this repair mode. And that's part of what the magnetic field of earth does. But what's fascinating and kind of, I don't want to say worrisome because I, I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but the magnetic field of the earth is, has been diminishing now over 4,000 plus years, right? We're getting into less and less magnetism at night. And so perhaps that's a reason why we're seeing more inflammatory issues that are not being healed at night, because we now know that the stronger the magnetic field, the more healing potential it has. So it's like, we're, we're, it, we just so happen to be living in a time where the magnetic field is weakening. And that's also coinciding with a time where we're more exposed to things that could create inflammation than ever. So uh, perhaps there's a correlation there that we're just need to maybe take that next extra step to help our body heal because we're in this weakened magnetic field. Okay. And is that, do we know why that's happening? Is that kind of a partly a man-made thing? No, actually what they've done was they, they, <clears throat> in the eighties, there was five countries that dug down really deep to kind of assess. Um, you can assess, you know, the, how the magnetic field has changed over time based on the orientation of certain minerals because minerals orient themselves too. And what they found is that every so often there's been nine, what they call pole reversals, which is what, you know, basically a decrease of the magnetism to zero. And then the pole reverses itself, you know? And so, and there've been nine of them and each one is associated with the, you know, a decent, amount of fossils. <laughs> um, and so that they've shifted. Clearly some species have survived through these things, right? But but it, it, it's a period of change for organisms on the planet, you know, and there is a, or an opportunity for these organisms to adapt to a, a change. And what they're finding is that this just typically happens where the the flow uh, the, the, the flow of lava and the magnetic field, it, it circulates in a way that it actually creates heat on the planet. And then that heat, uh, it, it weakens the ozone layer, the ozone layer 
gets bigger. The um, I don't, we don't need to get controversial with climate stuff, but the then what happens is you do have a, 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 a period where the sun's magnetic field becomes way more powerful than the earth's magnetic field. And that's where it's like a zero point, you know, where the sun has overpowered us. And then at some point, what happens is the lava actually starts flowing in a different way and it helps to build the magnetic field back up. And then it like starts back over again. You know, you get a rebuild up of the atmosphere, all of the ionosphere and then voila everything kind of recharges itself and, and that has happened nine times in history according now i'm not listen this is not my area of expertise this is just me reading the research from other people but it's been fascinating because there is definitely a pattern that they've they've discovered where something heats up you know it changes um parts of the atmosphere and then things shift back to then a kind of a new era if you will and so that's what we're in but like here's the deal i think scientists are saying we have 400 to 800 years before we start to approach the zero point. Okay. So, so you know, don't go out and panic. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly species survive through it. So yeah, that's where we're at right now. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So the one <laughs> the one thing um that I also really wanted to speak to you about was um kind of earthing and grounding. But mm -hmm. um, that might be something I imagine that we can talk about because what I would love to do is kind of um, whether that's now or in a little bit, finish the conversation around it. What are the practical things that we can do in these kind of three areas that yeah. can help us? Um, so is there anything else that you would like to kind of just break down and explain before we move into that? Or do you think that's a good foundation from a light magnetism water perspective? That's good. Let me just touch on light at night really quickly. Okay. And it's so we we I, we hear this a lot, right? That now we're recognizing that blue light is a negative thing, you know, and that they're talking about the fact that our screens emit a certain frequency of light, light bulbs emit a certain frequency of light, and so a lot of people perhaps shifted work to do more screen interaction over the past couple of years. And so, you know, there's maybe this, I, there's this recognition that, oh, I'm gonna need to protect my eyes or I need to do something to, to, to protect myself from excessive blue light. And what we're seeing is that excessive or, or blue light in general, blue light after sunset, blue light at night, it's a whole, it, it is associated with a whole host of inflammatory conditions from diabetes, obesity, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, inflammatory gut conditions, anxiety, depression. And it's like, wait a second, how could so many things be influenced by me watching TV at night or by me, uh, you know, turning on light bulbs at night. And when you start to see how important the circadian rhythm is, and you recognize that in nature, there is zero blue light in nature available to me if I were camping at, after sunset. And so having that particular frequency of light available to us 24 seven is very disjarring to my circadian rhythm. And so that actually impacts hormone balance. It impacts my ability to go to sleep. It impacts my, uh, it impacts my neurotransmitter production and all of these things that can have downstream, uh, my blood sugar levels, right? It, 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 and so all these things that you can see uh, how all of these kind of seemingly different conditions can be impacted by just this one particular, uh, you know, environmental condition. And that's that artificial light at night. Perfect. Yeah. I think, um, the light things are really interesting one as well from a sort of, I guess, ecological perspective. So I was seeing some research this week kind of sort of showing how in the ecosystem, just general biodiversity is less in areas where there's kind of the light pollution. Um, so it's affecting everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wildlife for sure is being impacted by this. Uh, I think you recently put up a post on, you know, what the earth looks like at night, you know, in terms of if you were to look at satellite images from 60, 70 years ago, there would be practically zero light pollution, you know, and, and then picture a hundred years before that. I mean, the light bulb has only been around since about 1879. So, so nowadays, if you, if we were to look at the earth at night, you could clearly see the outline of pretty much <laughs> most countries uh, because of the fact that it's so lit. And this is from, this is from a far distance, right? And so if we can, if we recognize that, that pollution, that light pollution, it wouldn't have been there just 200 years ago 
let alone 2 million years ago, that's a short amount of time for our physiology to have to adapt to a new environmental challenge, if you will. And I just, I'm not sure if, if we're there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So with all of that in mind, the key question is what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> it, there's lots of stuff we can do. you right. There's lots of stuff we can do. So, um, so my recommendations involve at the most foundational level, it's how can I make my daily life reconnect with the outside more, right? And so we know that, uh, I, I'm pointing here because I got a big window right here, but we know that glass blocks the infrared light, glass blocks the UV light. Uh, I never mentioned this, but UV light actually also helps charge up that water network in my body with electrons. And so being inside, it basically divorces me from two key sources, two, two key frequencies of sunlight, two key colors, if you will, that my body could use for free energy. And so first thing in the morning I mentioned is really, really key. And that's because as at, to be, to be outside, because the sun, as it layers its colors, those colors interact and do different things in my brain. So anytime someone can see the sunrise, you know, plus or minus five minutes, that is so important because seeing the sunrise sets that clock in my brain. It, it basically sets it going and it tells my brain, okay, it, currently where I live, sunrise is like uh, 7 26 in the morning. Uh, and so, so it tells, it literally tells my brain it is 7 26 in the morning. And that brain clock communicates that message to the rest of my cells to organize my tasks for the rest of the day. So I love seeing the sunrise before that. I don't want to stare at a bright blue lit screen, right? And so I, I, maybe I'll show this and see, but what I have on my phone is I've got, I make my screen really, really red. Red, it, it blocks the blue, right? If my, so if you can do things to make your screen red and there's different ways you can do that, you know, with the accessibility settings on an iPhone and apps like Twilight app on an Android, um, that that's a good thing because I'm not starting my day off by looking at a jarring hit of blue light that starts my clock. My brain clock thinks that's noon, right? And so, because that's about the amount of blue light intensity that, that would be around noon. And so I don't, I don't want that, right? I want to make sure that my brain is timed with what's actually happening out in my outside environment. So red until sunrise, go out and see the sunrise, um, you know, I drive with my windows out lately. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not able to just sit outside all morning. Now it, it would be lovely, right. If I could, but you know, I'm, I'm packing lunches and as I'm packing lunches, I've had my kitchen window open, or as I'm driving the kids to school, I, I have the sunroof open in spite of my 10 year old saying, mom, it's so cold. Close the sunroof. It's like, no, I'm not going to, right. Because I want that natural light in. Um, and so I'm just trying to get as much morning light into naked eyes as possible. These glasses, these puppies go up on top of my head. And then if I can, I sky gaze here and there. So, you know, as after I drop the kids off at school, I park and I will stare up, <laughs> I stare up through my sunroof for five minutes, just to, to the brightest part of the sky to get those photons into my eyes. That's a message. And if I don't do that, my brain's just missing that message for the day. And beyond, beyond setting my circadian rhythm with those frequencies, from about sunrise until about two hours later, there's key things like, so certain frequencies of light shortly after sunrise, that helps me organize my hormones, right? And so it helps to turn on something called my pituitary gland, which helps me make a whole bunch of hormones that my body needs, which is why we see a circadian rhythm. We can map hormones out to say, oh yeah, Carrie, we tested your hormones and they're normal, right? Because they fall into this range at this time of day. So we know that there's a normal range and what helps determine that is, is the light. And so seeing some of that morning sunlight helps that hormone balance when a specific ultraviolet frequency comes ultraviolet a that into my eyes makes serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine and these chemicals that are in my brain that literally make me feel so good. So I tell people, if you can carve out a morning walk in there outside with those naked eyes, it's a beautiful thing you can do for your mental health during the day because of the serotonin, the dopamine, the norepinephrine, the, the beta endorphin, right? That's runner's high chemical that we can actually produce simply from sunlight alone. And so getting those morning sunlight into our eyes and yes, of course, on the skin, but into the eyes as much as possible, that is so, so key. Excellent. And I like the 
I like you know, just having the window open. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. It's kind of like doing whatever we can within the context of our routine responsibilities, etc. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I always tell my clients, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? Yeah. Because the cool part about the, the quantum scale is that we just need little consistent habits for it to be impactful. And so it, it, it's called a nonlinear effect and it doesn't matter what that means, but it, it just, it's like, so if I literally see the sunrise for 60 seconds every morning, that is really, really big and impactful to my body. If I do sky gaze for four minutes after I drop the kids off, that's very impactful to my body because we're, we're not at the chemical level, right? It, we're, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, repair an iron deficiency, right? By, by needing to supplement iron for a month or two, right? To, to, in order to not be anemic anymore. Instead, I'm at that smaller scale and at that smaller scale, less but done consistently can be really, really important and impactful. And so, yeah, yeah, it's just like key things. And, and the other cool thing about light, Alex, is that it, it travels like a wave, like water. And so people are like, well, wh would, why would just cracking a window matter? And it's like, well, picture if you were, a picture if you had an aquarium, right? An aquarium full of water. What if you put a tiny little pinhole into that aquarium? that water would pour out, right? And so light actually behaves just like water, just in an, electromecha in an electromechanical way. Uh, and so what we have to recognize is that uh, it, we need to crack open windows and the light will come to us. So I have this window right here. It's, it's you know very cold here, but I have it cracked open still because I know I want those light frequencies to come into my environment. Perfect. Okay, and I think there's something really like, I don't know how to describe it, sort of deep, quite spiritual about witnessing sunrise and sunset. There's something energetic that you can almost just feel, I think. Yeah, it almost feels like a greater connection to humanity. Yeah. You know, I, I, it, it's a time where I recognize like, it, wow, we all have the opportunity to see this big ball in the sky at some point. And we're, so that's like the, a connecting factor to all of us. and you know, at the quantum scale, we're all connected anyways, but that's like a really, really visible cue. It's like, wow. Yeah. There's really something spiritual and powerful about it every morning. Mm, absolutely. And you mentioned, um, you know, there are various apps for the Androids and there are settings on the iPhones and things like this. And then obviously these ready for sunsets, like red mm -hmm. light blocking glasses or blue light blocking glasses. Um, there's apps like, or software like Flux, um, for computers and laptops, which obviously can be really helpful as well. Um, just turning lights off too, right? You know, it's almost like, can you live like like a cave, right? You know, or candles if you need to, but I've gone from just not turning lights on anymore, you know, and it, it's it kind of is weird for some people, but you just then start to get the natural rhythm, right? Your house will naturally start to dim as the sun sets. When the sun sets, we put those, you know, orange colored blue blockers on just like you have. And we've got a couple of, you know, Edison style incandescents, like a dimmer, uh, not super vibrant, bright light that we have in little table lamps um, that we use. And, you know, it's a very dim setting in the evening. And that's okay because that's what my body expects because I need to recognize that the sun is going down for me to even start making melatonin, my sleep hormone. Um, and so, yeah, so the combination of just getting some of those orange tone blue blockers and just having a dim house can really make a difference in improving, you know, when I go to sleep and then the, the quality and the depth of the sleep that I do get. I saw, um, this week, there's a company in, in the UK who are selling, um, I need to go back to what they were sort of discussing, but essentially bulbs that a, uh, they emit a more natural light, which changes with the day as well. Mm -hmm. So are these, are these worthwhile? Or would you say just like, don't using okay. lights, don't use lights. <laughs> just, just open a window if you can, right. And don't use lights because you're, uh, there's no way for an artificial bulb to, to exactly mimic exactly what's happening in your particular angle of the sun at the time of year, right? So literally every day it shifts slightly. If, if we're away from the equator, right? Even if you're just a degree away from the equator, it does shift. And so there's no way that we could possibly get it to be perfect for everyone, everywhere they're at all the time throughout the year. So, and then they also typically run on a Wi-Fi signal. And that's something I try to minimize. I don't necessarily want that signal, you know, blaring at me from a light bulb all the time either. 
So, so I would say, you know, it, it could, it, for some people, maybe in a school setting or in a work setting where they, they really need to do something that because they have no, uh, let's say, uh, let's picture a factory that has no access to, to natural light. Maybe that would be a better style of light bulb. I could, I could definitely see that, but I still don't think that there's any light bulb that could do what we can get just from natural light. Yeah. Okay. And actually something you mentioned in one of your Instagram posts that I, I literally was doing before we jumped on our call was setting your, um, changing the settings on things like your computer. So the, the background, making it like the dark uh, mm -hmm. font, but dark backgrounds, um, yeah. which I was like, oh, no, that's genius. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, it's like these little tiny things that you change once and then they're like that. And then they add, all this stuff adds up over time, Alex. And it really is like, wow, this is impactful. You know, if I'm really working on my light hygiene and like how, how my light environment is either working for my physiology or maybe harming it, that right there is a perfect thing. Make your screens black. Uh, same thing on your cell phones, you, you dark mode, right? Dark mode on all of it. That way it's just not something that's super vibrant staring at you all the time. So cell phones and computers as red and as dark as you can make them uh, can, can be great for protecting your eyes from the, the, the blue light toxicity that we hear about from the screens. Brilliant. Okay. Um, and what about sort of photobiomodulation? So sort of red light therapy devices, is that something that sort of fits in with this as well? I, I think it does. I, I think because, because we're just, oh, in inside, you know, the average American spends 93% of their time inside, right? Which is a very sad statistic. Um, but what I like in the red light therapy devices too, is it's like, it's like replenishing a nutrient deficiency because we're the, the glass blocks, the infrared and a majority of the red frequencies too. Then when we are in front of that red light panel, we're just replenishing a, a wavelength of light that's been missing. Uh, I prefer to use it in the morning because that's when it would have been available to me naturally. So I prefer to use it in the morning. Um, but I, I do know that I've seen people use it multiple times throughout the day. And as long as it's probably not the middle of the night, I've seen it have benefit to many people from uh, inflammatory conditions to recovery from a workout to mitochondrial health, those sorts of things. Perfect, okay. Um, and what about the earthing grounding elements to this? So, I mean, I'm standing on a, a grounding mat at the moment. I have no idea how effective <laughs> it is, but it makes me feel good nonetheless. <laughs> Let, let, yeah, let's talk about that. Con the concept of grounding, you know, I was never taught this. Maybe, maybe you were taught this as a child, but I was never taught that the surface of the earth had a, had a negative charge. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, and now we know that our cells, right. Our cells need a negative charge. So another way that we get that is because there's a literally electrons that are flowing from the surface of the earth. And we now know that we could touch it with bare skin and electrons will flow. And this is true of just a true rule of thumb. Electrons will flow from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And so because I'm not as electrically powerful as the earth, anytime I touch bare skin to the earth, the electrons are going to flow into me and they flow through that special water <laughs> of my body. And they're able to distribute themselves kind of like power lines, if you will, to the cells that need them. And one of the most outstanding visuals of this, Alex, is looking at red blood cells before and after grounding and or earthing. And it's, it's this idea that these red blood cells are like supposed to be like these beautiful separate little ferry boats as they travel through the bloodstream. And when they're lacking electrons, they actually, the boats actually start to stack up on top of each other. And so it's almost like stacks of pancakes of these red blood cells that then that they can't flow, right? That that's not, they can't, they especially can't deliver nutrients that way. And so the coolest thing is to look at, you know, red blood cells before and after. And what you see is like the, they, these people literally within 40 minutes, they go from stacked pancakes in their blood samples to like these beautiful individual ferry boats again. And it's because grounding pulls electrons into the red blood cell, but also around it. Every cell has a coating of electrons around it as well. And so it helps them to create this, this shell basically that these boats then can travel through the bloodstream independently. So that's one of the most, the, the quickest ways to, to see a visual between uh, before earthing and after earthing. And it's because of the electrons that we pull in through our bodies. Brilliant. And is there a kind of a, a specific recommendation? Is there any, any studies or just anecdotal evidence around how long would be, I guess, the minimum, bearing in mind that a lot of people are going to be limited to how long they can stand barefoot somewhere? <laughs> 
You know, yeah, I mean, it's all about context, really. The recommendations for people who have true inflammatory conditions like an arthritis or maybe an injury that needs recovery, that's 40 plus minutes. It also kind of depends on, you know, are you in a big city with potentially a lot of non-natural electrical flow that's happening either through the earth or, uh, you know, even through power lines. So I, I, it's all contextual, but let's say you were at the beach, like this beautiful beach and you had an inflammatory condition, 40, 40 plus minutes ish, give or take a day seems to be effective for inflammation. Um, but it's instantaneous, which is the cool thing that you'll, you'll get electrons just instantaneously because of that flow. It's like, it's like discharging a shock, you know, um, one of the, one of the things that my kids love to do at the playground is they go down these like plastic twisty slides and then they want to touch me before they touch the earth because they discharge electricity into me before they discharge it into the earth. Um, and so they'll give me this shock and I'm always like, ah, you know, getting, getting, getting shocked by my kids and they think it's a fun game. But what that is, is just showing you that it happens instantaneously, right? That, that flow will happen from someone who's got more of it to someone who's got less of it instantaneously. And we'll get that same thing with the earth. Which has got me thinking now around um, Dr. Neil Nathan, who does a lot around mycotoxins and molds, talks about um, electric shocks being like a common symptom in his experience. So is I'm literally just starting to think, is there a connection between that and what we're discussing? Yeah, that's that's a someone who has a lack of electrons is actually what that is. Huh. And so, yeah. And so I, I, one of the best things that it, it's, it's definitely an indication that their water there's oftentimes with that too, with a condition like mycotoxins, they have, um, a, a, an inability to hold water, right. Anti-diuretic hormone is off. Mm. And so they're not, they're not able to build their water battery in the same way. So they're not able, they don't have this, this ability to hold water in their cells that, that they can then charge up full of electrons. So it's definitely a big sign with that. And, I'm of the opinion that for someone like that who has an inability to hold onto water and minerals appropriately, they do absolutely need things like grounding on a regular basis because they need a secondary uh, source of those electrons to be able to power up their cells. Mm, that's fascinating. Okay. Um, and then in regards to, I guess the tech side of things. So there are there are grounding sheets, grounding pillowcases. There's kind of all sorts of different grounding things you can do. Are they? Do you think they are helpful at all, or are they sort of a little supplement if we're struggling to get barefoot on Mother Earth? Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic, right? Because there is some great research that's been done using the technology version of grounding, not Mother Earth, okay. um, that have shown a benefit. I think we have to be aware of, you know, number one, you have to have a grounded outlet. And there's also such thing as dirty electricity, mm. right? That flows through the walls. So if anyone's done an EMF course or anything like that. So what I recommend is if you plug it into a wall, you're going to want to get one of those. Uh, it, it's like the greenware, the Stetzer, uh, like it's, an, it, you, it's basically a dirty electricity um, repair for an outlet. And okay. so you can plug this thing into the outlet that then helps the dirty electricity. And then you would want to plug your device into that so that you don't get the dirty electric flow into the mat. And as a, as a really basic hack, actually, you can get just a copper rod and that copper rod, you can hammer it into the earth and you can wrap a copper wire around it and you can literally hold on. Uh -huh the exposed copper wire like as long as the copper is touching the copper you got like copper rod copper wire copper and you're, you'll get actually a flow that way as well so that's another way that you could just do really old school grounding <laughs> brilliant um because i guess what we're talking about partly there is um is redox so i yes. I, I seem to follow a lot of people who use the word redox a lot so yeah so yeah we're just kind of break that down because obviously we're kind of talking about it um I think it's a helpful thing to understand. And then I, I've got a question that I just want to sort of um, put onto the back of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So like, yeah, you hear redox potential or we need to have a high redox. Redox just stands for reduction and oxidation. And that's the basis of everything that happens in our body. Reduction means um, gaining electrons and oxidation means losing electrons. So as chemicals are kind of doing their interactions. One gains electrons, one loses their electrons, but you need to have enough electrons to begin with in order for these, in order for your body to be able to go through these redox reactions. You have to have electrons to donate in the first place, especially because a lot of us are actually 
creating more oxidation with lifestyle uh, and oxidation is like inflammation, right? So, um, and so, uh, you know, or reactive oxygen species and things like that. So we need more electron donors um, in the cells and that's synonymous with the net negative charge, right? So that's, we need, so basically redox is just, do you have enough electrons in your body to donate electrons to every, every reaction that's needed to capture those electrons? Uh, and so it really comes down to, if you're talking about a very, very basic way of looking at it, it's just more electrons than oxidative processes that are happening. Okay. And that's really the benefit of a lot with what we've been talking about, what you're saying with grounding as a way of getting these electrons from the surface of the earth into the body and then distributed to where they're needed. Um, mm -hmm. And so same with the water though, right? That, that negatively charged water, that's, that's a source. It, when, when ultraviolet light strikes it, it actually creates free electrons within that water, which is super quantum. And we don't have to go into the mechanism, but you, we actually now know that literally ultraviolet wavelengths create millions of free electrons in that water network. So again, we can be outside in those wavelengths and we can give ourselves more redox because of ultraviolet light striking the water. Okay. It's crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's brilliant. And uh, uh, what the thought that came to mind was, um, you know, uh, there's almost like an evolution of thinking for me and, and for a lot of people, I think, which is a client goes on holiday and they say they come back and they say they're feeling better. Sometimes they've been able to tolerate foods that they haven't been able to tolerate at home. And initially I was like, oh, you know, stress management, you just are too stressed in your day to day life. And then it moved to, well, maybe there's some sort of environmental exposure, like you've got mold in your home. And now it's like, well, maybe you're just getting more sunlight and you're grounding on the beach if you've gone to the beach. So yeah, yeah it's interesting. Yeah. I, I think, I think um, a huge factor is obviously, but you know what? I even get this, I get that same reaction in clients and I, it's not like their vacations are stress-free, right? They've got three little kids, two little kids that they're chasing around and they're trying right. to run, you know? And so it's not, it's a, it's a different type of stress, but being outside way more than they typically are barefoot touching that like being in the water especially the ocean that's like the ultimate grounding experience right there you're you get the sunlight you get the water you get the minerals uh you get the electrons and so yeah i honestly think what people are doing is they're charging up this water network with all the light nutrients that they don't get in their typical day-to-day -day lives they're missing the infrared from the sun because it's blocked from the glass and they're missing the ultraviolet from the sun because it's blocked from the glass and we're taught to fear it. And so now all of a sudden we're on holiday and we want, and we're out in that stuff. We want to soak it up. And yeah, maybe some vitamin D also is, is, is made through the skin. But I think a lot of it is that we're, we got these electrons and we now know that we can actually hold on to this charge. We don't know how long, but it's not just like it's there and it's gone. We can hold on to this charge for an extended period of time okay that's good to know mm -hmm. um a question that's popped actually two questions one that i had from previously and it surrounds i guess the gut microbiome and redox yeah. so one of the things that uh or a paper that basically was showing that in sort of i guess an in vitro in vivo type study that methanobrevibacter so a methane producing archaea uh, was only able to survive when it was exposed to certain antioxidants, including glutathione, for example. And that then another study showing that in children with severe um, malnutrition, that they don't have any methanobrevibacter compared to controls, where I think like 65% of them had it. And the, the authors kind of concluded that um, it was related to redox and low redox reduces the chances that you're going to have any methanobrevibacter or methane producing organisms. And with research more recently talking about how these organisms are actually keystone species, we've evolved with them for millennia, they're actually really important for us, but obviously when out of whack, they can contribute to their own sets of symptoms. Is there anything you can expand on from, uh, well, I guess anything we've spoken about today from a, a gut microbiome perspective, because a lot of our yeah. listeners are going to be either just very interested in gut health or actually struggling with chronic gut issues. Yeah, absolutely. The way the gut, the way the gut bacteria operate, it's fascinating. And I, you alluded earlier when we were talking about red light therapy to exposure to those frequencies, it enhances bacterial diversity, right? And we know that that's like, that's a keystone for gut health. We want a diverse uh, microbiome. Um, and what, what, 
what we never talked about was that every living cell everywhere on the planet, including bacteria, rele release ultraviolet light, UV light. So that's why our gut has the same receptors as our skin. And it's not because the sunlight does it, but the bacteria release ultraviolet light at key times in key pulses. And they're synced to our circadian oscillator, our circadian clock. And so they sync and do key things at key times of the day based on the fact that they emit pulses of this ultraviolet light that then we interact with in the receptors of our gut to do things. So you've maybe heard um, that serotonin is produced in the gut, right? We got a lot of serotonin, it's very important. Important. Well, what produces it in the brain or in the eye it is that ultraviolet light in the morning, right? It interacts with an amino acid in the back of our eye, and that actually produces serotonin in the brain. We actually then, as, if our circadian rhythm is intact, that morning light will tell the brain what time of day it is. It'll communicate it to our gut bacteria. They'll release a burst of ultraviolet light and they'll make the serotonin in the gut because the gut will take, you know, something like a trip. It's like tryptophan in the gut and the, it'll convert that tryptophan to serotonin in the gut, which is why first thing in the morning, we're more likely to have a bowel movement because serotonin helps stimulate bowel motility. Mm. And so there's a, I've had people who have had huge issues with, you know, with bowel movements who literally sink their circadian rhythm. And it happens naturally then because they, the gut respond in a very similar way to the, to the, to the brain, you know, making serotonin up here, they make serotonin here. It moves the poop through and, you know, they have a beautiful bowel movement in the morning. And that's just one example how the, how the bacteria communicate with our gut cell wall using light. The other really cool thing is that this exclusion zone water, it's the, the, the water in our body, it's formed everywhere, but picture the gut lining, right? We hear about leaky gut a lot. It's called exclusion zone, EZ, EZ, EZ water. It stands for exclusion zone water because literally it creates a barrier everywhere where nothing can penetrate it that's uh, except electrons and photons, except electrons and light. Literally anything bigger than a proton, gets it gets pushed away from it. And so how can we have leaky gut if we have exclusion zone water lining the gut lining? So to me, leaky gut is people not having exclusion zone water, lacking infrared light in their gut. They're not getting the infrared into their gut walls so that that exclusion zone water can build enough of a barrier to protect their, their, uh, their cell, the cell lining to basically, you know, heal leaky gut. So there's that too, right? I feel like exclusion zone water can be a huge missing piece in people who are looking to, 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 to heal from sort of like a, a leaky gut type, type pathology. Okay. Do you uh, know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, that's, it's awesome. So just to make sure I heard you correctly, in regards to the bacteria emitting this UV light, yeah. that's being triggered by light going into the eye to the SCN and then a message going down and then it's happening, is that right? Well, they're emitting it at all times, but the intensity of what they emit can change based on our circadian rhythm okay. so they can yeah they, they they've got just like we have a we have a circadian rhythm they have all bacteria on the planet have a circadian rhythm too because or, or or plants or anything it makes no sense for everything to be metabolically active when their energy source wasn't available which for most things their energy source is the sun so a lot of species of everything basically exhibits the ability to either uh you know be active during the sun and you know more quiescent during the, the nighttime or, or vice versa. You've got species that really thrive at night too, but there's typically a variation, a diurnal variation that happens. And that our bacteria do the same thing. They can respond to when our circadian rhythm tells us, tells us it's morning and they can go ahead and help us. Or if we're not tied to that circadian rhythm, or we're, we're never outside to recognize those ultraviolet light frequencies into the eyes, they can't do their work for us in the same way that, that they would be, right? Because we're not getting that ultraviolet light signal to the brain. So then they're not getting the message of what time of day it is. So they're not helping us, you know, in the, in the same way. So that could be, you know, dysfunctional microbiome uh, happening right there. You know, maybe a mic gut microbiome, then that also doesn't get the red and the infrared. And so they become less diverse. So they're less diverse, less responsive to what our body needs because our circadian rhythm is not giving them the right message. Mm, fascinating okay and then my maybe final question <laughs> um, is around food and the role that light and the seasons play within this because I'm 
I'm really torn at the moment between, you know, the main message in the nutritional therapy functional medicine space, which is, you know, just get as many different foods into your diet as possible. It diversifies the microbiome. It's good for your overall health. But it also is completely contradictory to like the evolution of mankind. So I understand that there's advantages to it. But I also am drawn to this idea that, and you'll know this far better than I do, but the fact that throughout history, we would have just eaten local in-season produce. And we have, we've got the research showing us that the Hazda tribe, for example, their microbiome wildly oscillates over the course of a year. So what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, I, I mean, I think I am way more apt to say that we need a seasonal nutrition because of the information that the food provides. That being said, the cool part about the Hazda, some Hazda studies showed that you, they could lit, when we try to, we researchers tried to manipulate their gut microbiome with garbagey type foods, right? You know, th and antibiotics and things that would have destroyed the average American's gut, right? their guts held strong. And so I feel like something we have to recognize before I even go to the seasonal food is that our gut cells, when we have a strong circadian rhythm, they're literally supposed to replace themselves every 48 hours or so. And the, I don't know if you've ever given anyone like, you know, an elimination diet or someone who really needs to eliminate a lot of inflammatory foods because their gut is really inflamed that can take three weeks or more for them to really help heal that leaky gut. So I'm, so it's really cool to rec to study a population like that and recognize that we can give them garbage foods, stuff that would put people under, you know, a celiac per person or someone with an inflamed gut would put them under for weeks, if not months and really inflame their gut. These people were not impacted because their gut cells felt the inflammation and they were able to repair it right away. So I think that we have to recognize a fine balance between a healthy gut is a gut that can eat, can technically eat anything, but it is a, and it's able to replace itself because the circadian rhythm is signaling it to. But that being said, I recognize food as a, a, another zeitgeber, another indication of what season and time of year it is in my environment, because plants can only grow when sunlight is so powerful. And so plants will grow at a certain time of year because they capture the photons, the powerful photons of light and fix them into sugar, into carbohydrate. And, and, that, and then during the winter, they die, right? They're not there. And so I then am meant to eat a bunch of these carbohydrate rich plants in my location in Michigan. It would be from summer into, into early fall, right? We would have, that would be the harvest here. We, I would have plenty of carbohydrates available to me. And then I would eat them and they would tell my brain and my body that it was summer into early fall. Because when we're, when we, when we break down food, Alex, we, we, there is no, you know, carbohydrate transport chain, or there is no fat transport chain. The mitochondria get electrons and they get the electrons from the food and the electrons in them contain a certain color of light based on what was captured from the sun. So you've got this broccoli, right? That captured ultraviolet light in its electrons. I eat the electrons with the ultraviolet light. Those electrons go to my mitochondria and complex one of my mitochondrial electron transport chain releases ultraviolet light. And it tells me that it's the summer and my mitochondria actually be, are supposed to become more dysfunctional in the summer. They create more reactive oxygen species because my body actually wants to store fat then. So then I get a, a, every mammal, if they are experiencing a seasonal a shift towards the winter, every mammal is meant to become a little insulin resistant and carbohydrate resistant in the summer, early fall, so I can store more fat because then those, the, the light signature is telling me that there's a period of cold that's coming and food will be scarce. And so I'll have to then reverse my insulin resistance so I could burn my fat stores all winter long by eating things like, you know, mainly probably animal meats or things that I could have hunted and maybe preserved a fish hunted, preserved uh, in the form of animal products. And then welcome to the spring again. And it starts all over. Amazing. You've reminded me of something actually as well in regards to what you mentioned with the Hasta tribe and eating them, giving them kind of junk food, which is there's research looking at um, Papua New Guineans mm -hmm. and the researchers basically discussed how they seem to have much greater microbiome diversity, even though within certain communities there, there's a really high um, sort of prescription of antibiotics. And they also discussed a potential mechanism around bacterial dispersal through 
living in communities, which mm -hmm. I thought was a really another kind of interesting way. So again, it shows us that you know the resiliency of, the, of that microbiome is so dependent on so many other elements of our environment, whether it's related to light, whether it's related to water, whether it's related just to the fact that we live in small communities and are essentially just more connected and therefore dispersing our bugs. Um, yeah. And are we just so susceptible to antibiotics in the modern world because the foundations are so compromised? Yeah, I mean, I personally think so. I, as someone who had horrible gut issues, you know, the reason why I went to go get my master's degree, um, I, I, there's foods that I couldn't have touched back then, even, you know, eating perfectly, right? With, with eating really well, you know, taking care of my leaky gut, doing my leaky gut protocol, all that. Now, I can, I can actually worry less about what I eat. Like I really don't have to worry much at all about what I put into my body. I, I, I hate to say that, right? Cause I think food matters cause we need to eat new, it's good to eat nutrients <laughs> um, and have nutritious food. The body needs nutrients, just like we need sunlight nutrients, but I'm so less inflamed than ever before. And it's because my circadian rhythm is so intact that I think that we're missing out on the fact that we're, we're assuming that because we're dealing with the tube through which food goes that only food affects it. And, and I'm a, the belief that there's so many other things that we're just barely tapping into and beginning to recognize in terms of how impactful it is for gut health. And that's a perfect example that you just gave right there. Mm, amazing. Mm -hmm. Carrie, I'm mindful of time and it might be a nice place to stop, but I always want to, I always like to give people the opportunity. So is there anything we haven't covered that you think is important just to mention or anything that you want to really kind of emphasize before we finish today? I, I just want to emphasize that morning light, right? If you do one thing, be more connected to the morning light in your environment, and that will start to shift a whole bunch of things in a beneficial way. Um, and so, yeah, I, that's the one thing I think that I want people to take home is just to recognize that we have to get outside more, even if it's a little break or with the windows down. And that's uh, at the quantum level, a really, really important thing. Amazing. Gary, thank you so much for coming on. I definitely think we're going to have to have another round at some point in the future. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love chatting with you, Alex. Thanks for having me so much. I appreciated it.